epileptic drugs. Following her treatment, Joan was later discharged in June 1958. On the 21st of September 1960, Joan was seen at home by a psychiatrist and was immediately readmitted to Lancaster Moor Hospital. The reason for this decision is unknown. During this stay, she again received ECT treatment and was given Melaril tablets, a type of antipsychotic drug. Joan was discharged from hospital in December 1960. Helm confirmed in her statement that Joan had continued to take her tablets up to the present time. Helm also commented that when Joan got married, she had been worried about her having children because of her mental condition. But, as Joan and Robert were of the Roman Catholic religion, birth control was not possible. Helm remarked that Joan had been, and I quote, mentally disturbed for the past 10 years. Sheila Rowe, a health visitor and state registered nurse, had known Joan Myring since the 14th of September 1964, when she started visiting the Myring home in the course of her duties. In March 1966, Joan spoke with Nurse Rowe. Rowe recalled that Joan was worried about her children and had been finding them hard to cope with. According to Rowe's witness statement, Joan had said that she thought the children were coming between her and her husband, and that her husband thought that she wasn't looking after them properly. In June 1966, Joan confided that she thought if she could get away for a week or a fortnight on her own without the children, she would feel much better. Joan had also expressed concern that her children might be taken away from her and that she would be sent back to Lancaster Moor Hospital. After the deaths of her children, Joan did end up back in hospital. On the 14th of November 1966, at approximately 8.45am, DC Patricia Buck accompanied DS Gray and DI Sanders to B Ward at Lancaster Moor Hospital. DI Sanders informed Joan that they were taking her into custody, charged with the murder of her two children. She was also charged with a third offence of administering a destructive thing to Stephen, thereby to endanger his life. She was cautioned for the offences and made no significant reply. However, at 9.33am, when DC Buck and Joan were waiting in the sergeant's office for Joan's solicitor to arrive, she started talking. According to DC Buck's witness statement, Joan, seemingly out of the blue, stated, All I've got to say is, I did it. DC Buck went and told Inspector Sanders immediately. When DC Buck returned, Joan said, I've made notes in here, indicating towards a small diary which was seized as an exhibit. Joan repeated herself once more, I can only say I did it. DC Buck made no reply but went and told the inspector once again. So what of the diary? Well, it was a Catholic diary for 1964, and on the 20th of December there was an entry saying, and I quote, Stephen and Gillian died, 8th of July, 1966. Joan was first interviewed by police at 3.15pm on the 8th of July, 1966. When asked what had happened to Stephen, Joan explained that at 12.45pm she had run a bath for Stephen. Once the bath water had cooled down, she put him in. Leaving the boy in the bath, Joan went and got a clean nappy for him. She cannot have been gone long, but it was during this time that Joan said Stephen slipped. She heard a noise, and when she got to him, he was laid full length face down in the water, and he was frothing at the mouth. Police asked Joan what she did when she found Stephen in distress. Joan explained that she pulled him up out of the bath and let the plug out. She explained how she tried to wipe him first, and then held him in a towel whilst patting his back, but he continued to froth at the mouth. She went and got a clean sheet but did not think to keep patting his back, thinking he was dead. Panicking, she then made the decision to go to her grandmother's to ask what she should do next. She recalled that by this time, Stephen's body was cold. Officers then began questioning Joan about Gillian, asking whether she had given her daughter the bottle that was found in the cot. Joan confirmed that she had given Gillian a bottle of milk at 10am, but when Gillian continued to cry, she gave her a drop of cold water. She then left her with a bottle while she bathed Stephen. Now you may be wondering, as I did, why Joan went to the effort of going all the way to her grandmother's house, and we will be discussing the journey later. 
rather than making the call herself or going to a next door neighbour's house, which might have saved her a lot of valuable time. While officers put this question to Joan, who explained that when Stephen had had an accident before, she'd gone to a neighbour who told her to ring the doctor. This neighbour was unfortunately on holiday and the other two neighbours were out shopping. As for making a call herself, it is suggested that the Myrings did not have a phone in their home. When asked about whether there was somewhere nearby where she could have made the call, Joan remarked that it would have been a 10 minute trot and she didn't know if the phone box would be available. Joan Myring was interviewed by police for a second time at 3.15pm on the 22nd of July 1966. This time, Joan had her solicitor, Mr Jackson, present. Officers began the interview by asking Joan how her children's health had been on the morning that they had died, to which Joan confirmed that both children were fit and had not been suffering with any illnesses. In the interview, an officer stated that a bottle had been found in the pantry at 8 Rough Hayes Lane. It was a camp coffee bottle which contained the insecticide malathion. Robert Myring had previously informed police that Joan was aware of what was in the bottle, as he had told her. Joan explained to police that her husband had told her it was an insecticide to kill greenfly, but that she didn't know the name of it. Her husband had told her to keep it on the top shelf, out of the way of the children. The shelf was too high for her to reach, so she had never touched it. Police were quick to jump on this comment. You've never touched it, never at any time? Joan clarified that a couple of weeks before the incident, they had got the insecticide down once to do the garden, but they didn't end up using it because it was raining, and so they put the bottle back on the top shelf near the cooking salt. So how did this substance get into the children? Joan explained, and I quote, I don't know. I'm not wanting to kill the babies. I wouldn't try to do away with them. I love them. I can't. You're asking me questions I don't know how to answer. I don't know. Joan agreed with officers that the children could not have got the Malathian themselves as the shelf was too high. However, she could not explain how the substance had got into the children's bodies. As part of the police investigation, it was revealed by Robert Myring that one of the baby bottles was missing. Joan explained that around February time, this bottle cracked when she was sterilising it, and so it had been thrown out. When asked about whether she had been struggling to cope with her children, Joan agreed that they were a bit of a handful. The time that Malathian takes to affect the body meant that the children would have had to take it within a few hours of them falling ill. As pointed out by officers, Joan was alone with the children from around 7.45am when Robert left to go to work. With this in mind, and with Joan's agreement that the children couldn't have got the Malathian themselves, police interrogated Joan as to how the insecticide could have got into the children's bodies if it was not administered by her. Joan was unable to provide an explanation. She simply said, I can't think of anything else, only to say I gave it them, but I didn't. Police returned to the topic of Joan's actions when she realised her children were ill. Joan explained that instead of taking Gillian with her, she thought she would get help quicker if she left the baby in her cot. It was a 10 minute walk to the phone box, but Joan feared that it would be in use. She also did not hear or see her neighbour Mrs Jackson and so assumed that she had gone shopping. It was at this point that she decided to go to her grandmother's on Lindsay Avenue as her gran was a nurse. Joan told police that she already thought that Stephen was dead at this point, as he was cold, before she left the house. Now I want to make a point here. Joan, it'll be, we'll discuss it later, but Joan's IQ was placed at 81, which is in the dull normal range. And I wonder if that, coupled with any difficulty she experienced through her mental illness, might have meant that common sense i.e. going and knocking on her neighbour's door, for example, to confirm she wasn't in, maybe was a bit clouded? I'm not sure. I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. In the interview, police questioned how it was that she got to her grandmother's house. Joan explained that she caught the 11C bus to Horseside Lane and got off there before getting the 26 to the depot. This journey took approximately 20 minutes. Interestingly, on her journey, Joan had passed a clinic without going in and seeking their assistance. 
Her explanation of this was that she had forgotten it was Friday, clinic day, at the time. Again, this links back to my earlier point about Joan's common sense. The course of action that she takes is not what I think an average person might do. Don't forget, she's making this journey to go to her grandmother's to ask what she should do next as she wasn't sure. We've seen this before um, when a neighbour had to tell her to ring the doctor when Stephen had hurt himself. Joan estimated that the whole journey to her grandmother's took her 45 minutes. 45 minutes is an incredibly long time when you think your child is at home, dying or even dead. You've also left your youngest unattended. When pressed again by police, Joan made the following comment, quote, No, sir, it's just, I don't know. It looks black. The picture's painted black. I am the only one in the house. The babies have got this stuff in their bodies. The only way I can say that is, I did it. It looks that way. Joan's solicitor, Mr Jackson, interrupted during the interview, saying that Joan had informed him that she had been taking tablets prescribed by the doctor because of head buzzing and was unable to control herself. When asked about whether she had suffered blackouts, Mr Jackson explained that Joan's account in private consultation agreed with the account she had given in interview. I'd just like to pause there. Um, nowadays, any instructions given in private consultation during a, a police interview, what happens is you, um, your solicitor will get the disclosure, you will have a private consultation with your solicitor and then you will decide how best to proceed an interview and then you will go into that interview. Anything said in the private consultation between client and solicitor is now protected by client confidentiality. So no disclosures like that would be made nowadays. When pressed by police, Mr Jackson said that he had contacted the clinic nurse who informed him that Mrs Myron was very fond of her children and took them to the clinic regularly. She also deposited money into accounts in her children's names. When asked what she had done the night before, Joan recalled that on Thursday she had got the children up and dressed them. She left to get her grandmother's pension between 9.50 and 10.30 a.m. She made food for the children, had lunch with her grandmother and then went into town. She put money into her own bank account and that of her husband's. She brought some shopping back for her grandmother and then they had dinner. She washed and changed the children and left her grandmother's no later than 7pm so that when her husband came in at 9pm, dinner would be ready. At the end of the interview, Joan denied any involvement in her children's deaths, but accepted that there was no one else in the house. The interview concluded at 4.35pm. According to a medical report on the mental condition of Joan Myring, dated the 13th of January 1967, she had been suffering with chronic schizophrenia, which substantially impaired her powers of feeling, striving and thinking. The report explained that there was also evidence of delusions of persecution. It went on, quote, She has shown by her actions that she is subject to unpredictable violent impulses. Her responsibility for these actions is diminished. According to a second medical report dated the 25th of January 1967, at the time of the offence, her condition had regressed and at that time she was the subject of delusional ideas about her husband and her neighbours and was undoubtedly depressed. The report put her IQ at 81, which was in the dull, normal range. The report concluded that at the relevant time, Joan was suffering from such abnormality of mind as substantially to impair her mental responsibility for her acts and omissions in doing the killings. Once Joan had been arraigned, that is, had the charges put to her in court, she was given the opportunity to say anything she wanted in answer to the charges. To both murder charges, Joan responded, and I quote, not guilty to human sin. Joan was sentenced to be detained at Broadmoor Hospital in Berkshire as a person suffering from mental illness, to be subject to the special restrictions of Section 65 of the Mental Health Act without a limit of time. And that ends today's episode. I try to find out what happened to Joan after her admission to Broadmoor, but unfortunately I couldn't find any further information. If any of you listening know what happened to her, I would be very grateful if you could let me know. Um, I just wondered if she was still married, if she was forced to um, sort of stay at Broadmoor 
for the rest of her life, whether she went to another hospital or whether she was allowed 